the Ten Commandments. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. There are some things out there in the world that every society, every community, that every religion and all people of intellect throughout history have agreed upon, such as the fact that lying is an evil, such as the fact that killing is considered an evil. Such as the fact that drinking doesn't lead to any good. Any person of intellect out there in society, no matter which portion of history he used to live in, he will admit to the fact that these are things that are either good or evil, depending on the object that you're dealing with, depending on the concept that you're dealing with. Similarly, truthfulness, telling the truth, is something that is considered a virtuous act, a virtuous deed, a manifestation of virtue based on people of all you know walks of life and all backgrounds and all societies and all eras. And there are some things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them a step further from them being simply things that are known to intellect to be goodness or evil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them divine injunctions. And these are what are known as commandments. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave commandments to the people of Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave commandments to the people that followed Isa alayhi salam, Jesus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gave commandments to people that followed any messenger. Similarly, Allah gave us commandments. And those are the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. And that's right, this show that we're doing now, it's going to be about the Ten Commandments. And these are not the same Ten Commandments that are in the Bible, but they're very similar Ten Commandments as well. They, as we said, are commandments that Allah gave. There are those commandments that Allah gave to the to the people of Israel, to the people that followed Isa alayhi salam. And since the source of all of these commandments is one, then naturally a lot of those commandments will meet uh, at some point as well. And that's why we see that there's a lot of similarities between these ten commandments, which we're going to be discussing from Surah Al-An'am, which are literally commandments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us to live by, and those commandments that were given to the people of Israel, and those commandments also that were given to Christians from before us. What are these ten commandments? And why focus on these specific Ten Commandments? These are the Ten Commandments upon which Allah's Messenger وسلم, left this dunya. How so? Ibn Mas'ud ta'ala anhu, he relates that the Prophet وسلم, had left us with Ten Things, Ten Commandments. In fact, he says, whoever wishes to know the wasiyyat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allati kana alayhi khatamuhu Whoever wishes to know the will of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every man has a will, right? Whoever wishes to know the will of the Messenger upon which he died, then let him read these three ayat. And those are the three ayat that we'll be discussing in great detail. Let's start. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ تَعَالَوْ أَتْلُوا مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ Say, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, come all of you to me so that I may recite upon you those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram upon you. حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ Those things that your Lord has made haram upon you. So we notice one thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding the messenger to deliver these commandments. So originally where are they coming from? They're coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine source. And that's why there's similarities between these ten commandments and the ten commandments that we find uh, in, the, in the Bible as well. Moreover, we notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the messenger, I will read upon you those things that Allah has made haram. Allah has made haram. If we read these verses in Surah Al-An'am, we'll notice that not everything in these verses are haram. Some things are obligations. But the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it haram, think with me, ponder with me just for a second. The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it haram is because if He called it a mere wasiyah, a will, we may think that maybe some of these wills are just suggestions, recommendations, they're not obligations. But since haram only means haram, Allah switched the word around from wasiyah to haram, so you understand that the injunction is, is binding. Any injunction that comes in this verse is binding. Just as haram is normally binding, similarly those that come the opposite of haram in this verse, obligations, they will also be binding and they're not just going to be recommendations. So every single... Uh, 
you know, commandment in these verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be giving is a binding commandment. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to stick fast, hold fast to these binding commandments. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to understand the will upon which the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had left this dunya. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome dear viewers to the Ten Commandments. Today we're looking at the first commandment. The first of the commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells His Messenger to deliver it on to us in the Quran in Surah Al-An'am. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا That you do not associate any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now before I even start discussing the concept of shirk and associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to say something right before that. In the beginning of the verse when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah has forbidden, your Lord has forbidden upon you these things. تَعَالَوْ أَتْلُوا مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ Come all people, all of you come towards me. Let me recite upon you those things that your Lord has forbidden upon you. Allah's Prophet ﷺ is commanded by Allah to use the term Rabb over here. Why? Because they say Rabb comes from the word Rabba Ya Rubbu, which can also have the connotation of Tarbiya as well. Which means teaching a person the akhlaq and giving the person the conduct and character and things of such sort. So basically what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell us over here is that these commandments that I'm giving you over here, they seem like big matters, but in reality, each one of them slowly but surely are going to give you noble character. Are going to give you character that is something that people can look at and say, MashaAllah, this person is an awesome individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah tushriku bihi shay'a. Number one, do not do any shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in reality, the association of partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that occurred after Tawheed was there, monotheism was there. Today, we find that monotheism tries its best to take people away from shirk. So it seems that people, some people or many people out there in the world may have monotheism as their innate nature, but that's not the truth. That's not the reality. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as found in a hadith Qudsi, خَلَقْتُ عِبَادِي حُنَفَاءِ I created my slaves, all of them on monotheism. فَاجْتَالَتْهُمُ الشَّيَاطِينُ عَنْ دِينِهِمْ Then the shayateen ended up taking my slaves away from their religion. So the reality and the essential, innate nature of mankind and human beings is that they are upon monotheism. And similarly, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Every single child is born upon the innate nature. And what's that innate nature? That innate nature is that we do not commit partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another factor to keep in mind over here is that if a person associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if he's doing that, considering the fact that Allah is his divine and ultimate Lord, but this person can help me reach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is doing su dhan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is having evil thoughts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How so? He is basically questioning the capacity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver whatever this man is asking. This miskeen that's a dot in the universe or not even a dot in the universe, he is questioning the ability of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver him from his problem. That is su'udhan. That is having evil thoughts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, do not let any of you die except that he has good thoughts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us have good thoughts with him. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us be upon the white plane, upon the plane of Tawheed, upon the plane of monotheism. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. The Ten Commandments.
بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم The Ten Commandments Today we're looking at the second commandment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And with your parents you should do good With your parents, you should do ihsan. Ihsan is to perfect your conduct. Ihsan is to perfect anything and everything you do in life. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the commandment to perfect our conduct with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He uses the term ihsan, which has this connotation of goodness and beautification. So not only do we have to do good to them, we also have to beautify that good towards them. Sometimes you can do good things to people, but you know, the way you do it, it's not that good. So not only do you do the good, like let's say for example, you owe somebody some money, you return the money to them, but you do it late. Along with the fact that you're doing it late, you end up, uh, you know, taking some of the money and then you return half of it later on and so on and so forth. All of that because sometimes people are of this nature, they don't want to return back what they've taken. Inshallah, you're not that way. Inshallah, anyone you know is not that way. But the point is that that is there within society. When we're dealing with our parents, not only do we do good to them, but we also perfect that good. So it comes out beautiful. It comes out with husn. It comes out with beauty. That's the way we're supposed to be with our parents. Now notice, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ihsan ahsana yuhsinu the verb uh, in the arabic language has two different ways for us to use it we can say ahsana bi shay wa ahsana ila shay we can say ahsana bi shay aw ahsana ila shay he ended up doing good towards that person he ended up doing good with that person or with that concept When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the parents in the Quran and in multiple places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term bi أَحْسَنَ بِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And with your parents do the good. What's the difference between the two? See, when you see a person on the street just walking around, you know, you don't uh, know him too well, but the person is poor and you can see he's got a problem. You can see he needs some help there. You take some money, you hand it over to him, even if you're going through a tough time, you've done good, but you've done goodness towards him. That's it. After that, your relationship with him is no longer there anymore. You're not going to meet him, you're not going to greet him, you're not going to talk to him ever again. That's it. You guys have, you know, unless you see him in another spot, likely than not, you will not be able to meet him again to do that good. But with the parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the goodness is not supposed to be occurring once and that's where you stop. You know when you have a goal? Whenever you have a goal, you get to that goal and you stop, right? And that's why you, the, you use the term إِلَىٰ وَصَلَىٰ إِلَىٰ إِلَىٰ مَكَانٍ كَذَا وَكَذَا وَكَذَا Right? He ended up reaching to this spot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَارِعُوا إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةً So your end goal is to مَغْفِرَةً of Allah. That's what you're trying to reach, right? When you end up doing good to somebody, you do that good. If, you, if Allah uses the term إِلَىٰ or you use the term إِلَىٰ, it's you've done it and that's your goal you finished. But the type of ihsan that Allah wants from you towards your parents, from me towards my parents, from our parents towards their parents, and from their parents towards their parents, and from our children towards us, and so on and so forth, is a type of good that sort of envelops the individual. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ ihsana. And with your parents do the good. So whenever your parents are there, the goodness has to remain. There is no end goal. So long as your parents are available, the goodness remains. And even after the parents are there, the goodness remains as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq to practice to convey. Notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the concept of parents second to nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And he does that in many places in the Quran. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that you worship no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and that you do goodness to your parents. So next to no one is the rights of the parents except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. That's the only person that after whom the rights of uh, rights of the parents come. Before them is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After Allah is the parents. And this also shows us something else. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell you that if you are not able to do good to your parents, then likely you're not going to be able to do good to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Why is that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did create you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did blow the soul into you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did command for your creation to occur as well. Allah did command for your, your existence to happen and He created your existence as well. 
But when you came out, you came out through the means of your parents. You came out to this world through the means of your parents. So if you're not even able to do good to the means, how are you going to do good to the origin? So Allah says, do good to me, be monotheistic in your interactions with me, do not associate partners with me, and then you remember your parents as well, because that is the Rasul, that is the means. And that's why when we're ta- to dealing with warfare, though we're war- far away from it, what happens? When we want to do good to the origin, we want, when we want to do good to the country that is dealing with us, we do good to what? the ambassador of that country. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made your parents the means for you to come to the world. If you do good to your parents, then and only then will you be able to do goodness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is captured in the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says, whoever is not thankful and grateful to the people, he will not be thankful and grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your action uh, points over here are number one, go right now, right after this video finishes. And if you've never done it in your life, I know it's going to be difficult, but go and kiss your parents on their forehead right now. And if your parents are not with you, at least call them and tell them, I love you. Even if those words are difficult, even if it feels like a mountain is about to fall on you, it's not going to fall. Nothing's going to happen. You're going to be perfectly fine. But what's going to happen is your scale of good deeds are going to go higher and higher. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq to practice, to convey. Jazakumullahu khairan for listening. على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين The Ten Commandments بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم The Ten Commandments Today we're looking at commandment number three or the third commandment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ولا تقتلوا أولادكم and do not kill your children Min imlaq, because of your fear that you have of poverty, or because of poverty itself. In one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, khashyata imlaq, because of fear of poverty. In this one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because of poverty itself. Nahnu narzuqukum wa iyahum. We are the ones who will end up giving you the risk. We will give you sustenance. Sustenance is from Allah alone. And also we are the ones that give them their risk as well. So the risk is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He spoke about His rights. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the rights of the parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now speaking about the rights of the children. So every single person is included within the equation. At times, people may end up speaking about the rights of the parents, but they forget that children also have some rights here. Right? And that's why sometimes children start to frown and they're like, well, everybody's always talking about the parents, but my parents... They're so difficult. My parents are so this way. My parents... Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not neglect the right of any, rights of anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about His rights. Right after that is the rights of the parents. And then comes the rights of the children as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks over here about the most evil phenomenon that the pagan Arabian society had known. And that was that the pagans would at times take their children and bury them. That was known as Wa'adul Banat, specifically to the daughters. They would literally take the daughter and bury her into the ground. And why would that occur? Well, they were afraid that maybe when she grows older, she may bring some shame to the family. She may end up doing something that will be shameful to the family. And if she grows older, she'll be a liability and not a, she won't be able to bring us money. It, that's not the case. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands the people for the male children and the female children, do not kill. Taking away the life of a person is not a solution. Especially for a small problem. Small problem when it comes to this type of evil deed that you're doing. It is a big problem if there's a famine, if there's you know bad economy. These problems can be really grave. But that doesn't mean you start killing people, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not kill the children. And they would do that also with male children as well. They would kill the male children because of faqr. Because of uh, the fact that they would be afraid of poverty or they had poverty. So it would be one of... one. Case or the other case. Either they had prov- poverty themselves, at that moment they were poor and they're like, well, I can't even feed myself, how am I supposed to feed my child? Or 
What would happen is they would be afraid. They, well, I have the money right now, but it doesn't sound like I'm getting any other avenues of income. If this child grows up, he's going to eat all my money. I'll have nothing left. So this is what they, this, the pagan solution was. They would just kill the child or bury the child. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got rid of this pagan practice by bringing the monotheistic faith of Islam to the society that at times would do a lot of inhumane things, but Allah brought humanity to them. لا تقتلوا أولادكم Do not kill your children من إملاق Out of fear of poverty Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala noticed throughout the verses so far that we've read in the first episode Throughout these verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a tense different than the tense that He's just about to use now Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts using the first person So He says نحن نرزقكم We are the ones that will give you rizq we are the ones that will bring you risk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will bring you risk. But Allah refers to Himself, one with the royal we, we. Why? Because the royalty will be able to provide. That's the thing about the royalty. Any person, any time when you have poverty or you have famine or you have a you have a drought, who do you turn to? The rich people in the society. So Allah says, above all those rich people is myself and that's why I'm using the royal we over here to get the message across that I am the divine and I am the ultimate royalty and I will provide for all of you. نَحْنُ نَرُزُقُكُمْ We are the ones that provide you. وَإِيَّاهُمْ And we are the ones that will be providing them as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here is trying to remind them of something else. And that is that this message of sustenance is so particular to Allah that the tense didn't capture that Allah was speaking before, right? The tense captured that Allah was commanding the messenger to deliver a message across to them. O oh messenger, tell the people to come to you and tell the people to come to you after you tell them, then say, Allah tushriku billahi shayya, do not commit partners with Allah, do not, do not. So the tongue is the tongue of the messenger. But now Allah uses the first tense. Why? The first person. Why? Because He wants you to recognize that poverty can only be solved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how many degrees you have, no matter how much, you know, whatever you have, even if you kill your children, the poverty will remain, but the solution is in the hands of Allah. So you turn to the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone to find this, the solution for this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَحْنُ نَرُزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ Another point to notice over here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, we give you sustenance. And there's no discussion about the sustenance of them. They feel like they've already got sustenance. The problem is the children. But Allah flips the coin on them and says that you people are thinking that the rizq that they're gonna get is actually your rizq. But it's not. Because we gave you this, we gave you sustenance, and we will give them sustenance. You might be a poor person. You might be a poor person. The child might not be a poor person. So why kill the child who might actually be the richer, richest of the rich? For the poverty that you're experiencing. We give you risk and we will give it to them as well because they've got their own sustenance. You've got your own. If you've got poverty, then don't mess with your children for it. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to practice, to convey. The take home message over here, even though our societies, probably most societies in the world don't practice such practices anymore, is that when we talk about our own rights as parents, we should also remember that our children have rights as well. Oftentimes we see nowadays, for example, this phenomenon of you know taking a snapshot of your child and putting it online. If somebody else does that to you, start arguing, brother, I wanted my privacy, we're in a private meeting. Well, your child is sitting there doing his own thing, privately, leave him alone. Stop taking pictures of him putting it online. Maybe he wants privacy. He's got rights just as well as you do. If you were going to be you know, asking people for your rights about taking your picture and putting it somewhere where you didn't want it to go, maybe when he grows up and says, Father, brother, I wanted my rights. You took pictures of me when I was two years old in my diapers and you put them online. Now I feel so ashamed. Right? So they've got rights, we've got rights. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us give the rights of each other. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, alhamdulillah, hamdan, yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafi u mazidah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidina ilman ya kareem. 
The Ten Commandments, we're looking at commandment number four. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الْفَوَاحِشَ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ Do not go close to shameless acts. Do not go close to those acts which normal people, people whose natures haven't been twisted yet, they are actually ashamed of. Don't go close to those acts. Not only does he tell you not to do them, you know, he's telling you do not go close to them. So what's implied over here is do not do them. That's understood just by you know the nature of the language. It's understood right away when you hear don't go close to something, don't do it as well. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to tell you not to go close to it because He wants you to stay far, far away from it. لا تقربوا, don't go close to it. الفواحش, those evil and shameless things. There are a lot of shameless things out there in society. Allah doesn't define one specific shameless act. Act. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala generalizes and says, anything that you think is shameless, stay far away from it. Now let your mind wander for a second and think about all the shameless things that happen within society, whether that be zina, fornication, adultery, whether that be people meeting up in manners that are illicit, whether that be people watching things that are not appropriate, whether that be anything else that's shameless that you can think about, whether that be when you walk into the market and there's a lot of pictures out there that you're not really supposed to be looking at, you're driving on a highway and up top you look at something, you almost lose track and get into a car accident, right? Those are all shameless things in society and that's the direction that a lot of societies are, are going towards, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't even go close to them. So if you know a road that you can drive on and all those billboards are not there, then drive through that road. Especially if you can get there and in ample time as well. Drive through that one because at least you'll stay far away from all those shameless things. لا تقرب الفواحش And the plurality over here shows us that anything that is fahish is being referred to over here. لا تقرب الفواحش ما ظهر منها وما بطن Whatever is apparent of it and whatever is very, very hidden of it as well. Because yeah, some people, you know, MashaAllah, Tawarakallah, it's got a big beard. Allahu Akbar. But when we go to the bedroom or when we go to the room and the computer, then there's a lot of funky things happening that we don't want to know about. So those are wama batan. Those are the things that have been hidden. So Allah tells you, there are people out there in the society that will go close to shameless things even if they're out in the open, even if it's happening in a mall, in a club, on television, behind a camera, whatever, what, what have you. But there's people out there that will do it behind closed doors. Yes, the people that do it behind closed doors, they're still not doing it apparently. It's not as bad. But he's telling you, do not do it neither apparently, nor should you do it behind closed doors. Don't even go close to it. And notice that Al-Fawahish, the command over here is to not go close to it. Meaning, at times there's prefaces to fawahish. There's a fahisha, and then there's prefaces to fawahish. There's shameless acts, and then there's things that will lead you to that shameless acts. Sometimes it's a con- conversation, and this happens, we all know in the MSAs a lot, right? Well, no, I'm just meeting up to organize for this big sheikh that's coming in town and it's going to be like a nice event. And, and, and you know what, in those realms we're allowed to, and I already got a fatwa about this, right? I already got a fatwa about this and I know I'm not going to talk about that. But then before you know it, the phone calls happen and then the text messages are exchanged and then the emails get exchanged. Actually, emails probably happen a lot before that. Then the fake Facebook page thing happens and then you have this sister and this brother that have no... People of the opposite gender on their Facebook pages, except three people. They're like, well, these three people are justifiable. Why? Because, well, these people I work with for the da'wah. And then after that, things go even further. Well, we have to meet up for the meeting. Subhanallah, astaghfirullah. Oh, I was expecting that there will be no khalwa in this meeting. I was expecting we will not be by ourselves. But qaddar Allah wa ma This is all from the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. فَإِنَّ لَوْ تَفْتَحُوا عَمَلَ الشَّيْطَانِ Even the hadith come at that time, right? Because if I say if, ands, and buts, that will be opening the door to shaitan. Now we have to do this meeting in khalwa. But inshallah ta'ala, we'll try to, sister, let's try to keep focused on the topic. And then the topic goes from there to a next topic. And then that is the qurbul fawahish. That is going close to the fawahish. That is opening the doors for fawahish. There is no... Time where a man and a woman, opposite genders, opposites attract, right? Opposite genders, they come together and there is no third person except the shaitan is not there. This is the promise of the messenger that a man doesn't go alone with a woman except the shaitan is a third of them. Stay far away from fawash. 
And another pointer to note over here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember He talks about His rights, then He talks about the parents, then He talks about the children, right? His rights, parents, and then children. Then right after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about fawahish. What's the connection here? Why speak about shamelessness right after the parents and the children? Because you see, parents and children are a result of relationships that are halal, far away from fa'isha, that are far away from shamelessness. But then comes the concept of fa'isha, shamelessness, which takes away the entire you know, manner or takes away the entire cycle upon which society is formed and that is a man coming together in a halal relationship with a woman and resulting to a child and that right there is a cycle of life but when shamelessness comes in and that's why a lot of societies that have shamelessness there they have a very very low birth rate, why? Because shamelessness is there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spokes about the right, speaks about the right of himself, and then he speaks about the rights of his parent, the parents. Uh, he speaks about the rights of the children, and then he says, don't become shameless. Why? Because when you do that, there will be no parents, and there will be no children, and that's why a lot of races today, as we speak, by 2050 and by 2000 something, they're at the verge of extinction. Why? Because there's a lot of shamelessness. People are not having, uh, you know, marital relationships in a marriage contract. It's all extramarital. Nobody wants to have children. Shamelessness is prevalent within society. The take-home message today is stay far away from fawahish. Shamelessness. Do not let the open, do not let yourself open the door. Dafi'ul khatara. Some of the ulama, they used to say, even if you get the thought, take it away from your head. That's the door to evil. Because if you take that thought and you let it be there, then it will slowly become more of a thought. And then more of a thought until it finally becomes an action. So take that thought away. If you're with someone, you think you can handle it, you cannot handle it. Let me tell you, I'll fill you in on this. You might not know yourself, I know yourself better than you. Why? Because I'm getting the guidance from Allah and I'm bringing it to you over here, right? That is that you don't know yourself. You don't know yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you better. The messenger knows you better. Stay far away from those type of relationships. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq to practice, to convey. And again, stay far away. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم This is your brother Abdul Wahab Salim and we are with the Ten Commandments Commandment number five Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 151, And do not kill the soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden for it to be killed except with justice, except with truth. That is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards you. That is the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ All of these pieces of advices that I've given you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to you and I, they are so that we may be able to have intellect. These are guidances from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we may be able to acquire, so we may be able to attain intellect. What does that mean? Inshallah, we'll get back to that point in a minute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in number five, لَا تَقْتُلُوا وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا And do not kill النَّفْسَ الَّتِي The soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden for the murder of. Every soul is considered a soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden the murder of. Whether that be a Muslim soul or a non-Muslim soul, whether that be a soul of a young child as we noticed earlier on in the verse as well, whether that be the soul of an older person, all of those souls are considered souls that have sanctity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considered these souls haram, impermissible for a person to go and, and take the soul away. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the body, the mind and the soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who takes the life of a person away and not human beings. They're not supposed to intervene in this process of Allah giving life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking life himself away from an individual. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لا يزال الرجل, think about this, very very carefully. In fact, 
Even better, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزال المؤمن A believer remains. How does he remain? في فسحة من دينه He remains free from any problems in his religion. A believer remains free from any problems in his religion. Sometimes there are groups out there and there are people out there that try to justify killing in the name of religion. Allah's Messenger وسلم, is saying a believer remains free from problems within his religion. مَا لَمْ من حراما. So long as he doesn't take a life away. So long as he doesn't spill a blood that is impermissible for him to spill. So the problem in faith and not faith itself. The problem in faith is when people start to take lives away. And this is why this ruling of taking a life away of a person wasn't a ruling that is specific to this religion. Remember we said, these are the Ten Commandments. Commandments that were known to all faiths. Commandments that intellect dictates. Commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took up after the fact that intellect had dictated them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them divine guidance as well. So this was a guidance given to every single faith. In fact, it was given to the Jews, it was given to the Christians. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran as well, مِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكَ كَتَبْنَا عَلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ For that reason, we have written upon the Israelites, whoever takes a soul, أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Whoever takes a soul without any justifiable reason, same thing. Without a justifiable reason, then what happens? فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا It's as if he's killed all of mankind. And the reason why Allah is relating this commandment to the Israelites, to us in the Qur'an, is because it's a commandment for us as well. And it's guidance for us as well. That if a person takes a soul away without any justifiable reason, then, and by the way, I keep saying justifiable reason, when we say, well, I have a justifiable reason, your reasons are not justifiable. Most people that kill, in fact, almost all people that take a life away on the face of this earth do not have justifiable reasons. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever takes it up away without a justifiable reason, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it as if He's killed all of mankind. And now whoever is the savior of one soul alone, it's as if He's the savior of all of mankind. Think about it, brother. Before you were getting yourself into these things, there's a lot of ideologies out there. There's a lot of mental mentalities out there. This is a message, by the way, for the non-Muslim viewer. It's a message for the Muslim viewer. The non-Muslim viewer needs to recognize that the Muslim faith is a faith based on peaceful behavior. And this is why if you look at these verses that we're looking at, which are our Ten Commandments, two of those verses are telling us not to kill, not even one. And more than one is addressing the concept of giving life by bringing back the cycle of life through the family relationships and properly so. So they're telling us to bring life about and they're telling us to stop taking life away. So we're a peaceful faith, that's a definite. And for a person who tries to, to misconstrue the faith and tries to take the verses out of context and doesn't understand the context of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks, then recognize that these are ayat that are muhkamat. What does that mean? That do not have the possibility for them to be further explained. That do not have the possibility for them to be abrogated. That do not have the possibility for any other meanings to be there. These are extremely clear passages. And this is why the Sahaba, they would call these ayat the muhkamat. In the Surah Al-An'am are three ayat, ayatun muhkamat, that are absolutely clear, evident, they cannot be further explained, they're not ambiguous in their meaning. These are all meanings of the word muhkam by the way, and they do not become abrogated as well, because these are things that every single person agrees upon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكُمْ وَصَاكُمْ بِهِ This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you as a wasiyah, this is the will of Allah. So remember we said earlier on, though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, حَرَّمَ a harram, one may say all of them are permissibilities, right? Harram rabbukum. Ta'alaw, come tell, O oh Muhammad, tell the people, come to me. Let me read upon you those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. And we said, in the verses are those things that are obligations, and in the verses are those things that are, that are commands for us to stay away from. Why does Allah carpet the whole equation with the word haram and not the word wasiyya? Because the word wasiyya has a possibility of recommendation. And the word wasiyah has the possibility of an obligation as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a tough word for you to recognize that throughout when I say, this is my wasiyah, it's not a wasiyah that you, can, you have a choice to implement or not. 
It's not a will that you have a choice to implement or not. This is a wasiyah, just as a haram you have to stay away from. This is a strong wasiyah, you have to implement it, and anything that I'm telling you not to do, you stay far, far away from it. ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ And remember this whole thing I'm telling you about wasa and haram and all this kind of stuff. This occurs not once in this passage, not twice, it occurs three times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really trying to hit home run with this message. This is an obligatory will for me. Commandments that you have to implement within your life. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So they, that you may end up having aql. Now notice Allah gave you five commandments so far. Every one of them is related to the aql. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to stay away from shirk, shirk and the fact that we worship the Lord that has created us and not His creation, that is intellect right there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to be kind to our parents. The fact that we are kind to those people that served us all throughout the days that we weren't able to do anything, not even change our own diapers, not do any of those type of things. They were the ones that were there for us when we became sick. They were the ones that were there for us when we had tough times. When they, their friends would say something about us, they would pick fights on our behalf even though they've had relationships with them for longer than they have with us. Why? Because there are parents, there's a special love. Allah tells us from the intellect is that you be kind to this, uh, this type of a person. Similarly, all of the other commandments are from the intellect. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq practice, to practice, to convey. Jazakum Allahu khairan for listening. And the action item here is that do not kill. Period. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, alhamdulillah, hamdan, yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'una bima alamtana wa zidina ilman ya kareem. The Ten Commandments, this is your brother Abdul Wahab Salim and we're doing the number six, sixth commandment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا مَالَ الْيَتِيمِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنِ And now we are in verse number 152 from Surah Al-An'am. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا And do not go close. Do not go close. Right when you hear this word, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا You suddenly remember the previous example in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the same word as well. There's another commandment we looked at. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الْفَوَاحِشِ do not go close to shameless acts. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina. Don't go close to zina. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, do not go close to where? مَالَ yatim, The wealth of the orphan. Why? Why use this same term that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala normally uses in the Qur'an for shameless deeds, normally uses in the Qur'an for zina, because this is how harsh the you know, outcome, this is how harsh the forbiddings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how harsh the commandment and hard the commandment, severe the commandment is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a person to avoid going close to the wealth of the person that is a yateem. Also because, you see, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about dealings of human beings with one another, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا do not eat amwalakum, your wealth, baynakum, between you, bilbatil, without any justifiable means. Don't eat the wealth of one another. Don't steal from one another. Don't take the wealth of one another unjustifiably. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. But He uses the word eat. Why? And He uses over here, la taqrabu, don't go close. There's a difference. Why? Because you see, when you go close to the wealth of a full grown human being, the problem will actually occur when you actually get your hands on the wealth and eat it or you do something with it you spend it in some way right that's when the problem will actually occur you take the money you spend it somewhere that's when it will occur otherwise the person will be there to fight back you'll say no this is my money you can't take this however if it's a yatim child an orphan child no parents no fathers no uncles no one to take care of him then who's going to take care of him? The person that is the guardian. And the guardian will be the one that will have access to his wealth. He can do whatever he want. And this, this young child, he can't tell him anything. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't even go there. I know it's really, really you know, tempting, 
There is no guardians for this person except yourself. There is no one to save this person's wealth except yourself. Don't even go close to it so you don't get tempted. Just as Allah tells you, don't go close to shamelessness so you don't get tempted and you actually fall into zina. So over here, don't go close to this wealth because wealth and also, uh, you know, the human need towards sexuality, those two things are too intriguing to a man. They just, and a woman like, we just cannot, you know, prevent it from occurring if we go close to it. So Allah recognizes our psychology, tells us stay far, far away from it. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا مَالَ الْيَتِيمِ Do not go close to the wealth of a child that is an orphan. إِلَّا بِالَّتِي إِهِيَ أَحْسَنِ But what you can do is that you can do something good to it. Take the money. This yatim child, orphan child, he, you know, he was a child of very rich family, from a very rich family. So they left him behind a fortune. You can take this money and invest it for him. You can put it in halal investments and then when the child grows up he can accrue the benefit of those halal investments. That's perfectly fine. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you here. إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهِ This is also a very important point over here. Until he reaches the ashud, Until he reaches the point where now he can handle himself. Sometimes it's very very difficult for you to give up a power that you have and you've had for a very very long time. And that's why at times when children grow up, it's harder for parents to give in to the fact that now they have their own lives. Right? Because the whole time the parent had the responsibility of the child and also had the liberty to do whatever he wants with the child. Command him this way, tell him not to do this, tell him to do this, tell her not to do, tell her to do. This is a liberty that people have, but it's a responsibility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when they get past a point where no longer do you have to take care of their wealth, then move away. Let them do their own job. Let them do the orphan. You can't hoard his wealth. It's not yours. As soon as he gets to an age where he's able to do, he's able to transact in a proper, proper manner, or she's able to transact in a proper manner. You walk away from the wealth and you say, "Here you go. You can give him some guidance." That's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa in anastum minhum rushdan fadfau ilayhim amwalahum." When you end up seeing that they're rightly guided, i.e., they're able to transact properly, at that time you take the wealth and give it back to them. I.e., the point when you give the wealth back is when you see that they're able to transact, and even at that time you can still give them guidance because you still have, in one way or another, some guardianship upon them. So the point to take home over here is take care of the orphan. Why do I say this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a very specific matter because this specific matter was a phenomenon that was widespread within the pagan society but he wants you to realize that just as I told you to take care of my own rights by not associating partners with me the parents rights by you know being very kind and gentle to them by the children's right by avoiding all forms of you know tyranny and all forms of transgression against the children by the rights of all of the other rights that I've mentioned Similarly, I'm not forgetting that member of society that has no parents to take care of him, right? This child may say, well, you know what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the rights of the parents and the children. I'm in an equation where there are no parents. Allah remembers his rights as well. So go from today and remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أَنَا وَكَافِرُ الْيَتِيمِ كَهَاتَيْنِ فِي الْجَنَّةِ I and the person who takes care of the yatim are like these two fingers in Jannah. You will be close to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah if you take care of the yatim. It's very easy and it's not very expensive as well. But it is very very fruitful on the day of judgment. It is a lucrative opportunity for you to invest. جزاكم الله خيرا for listening. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم The Ten Commandments This is your brother Abdul Wahab Salim and we are looking at commandment number seven number seven and this commandment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْفُ الْكَيْلَ وَالْمِيزَانِ And fulfill the measure and fulfill the weight. بِالْقِسْطِ With justice. So the commandment over here 
is another one of those social commandments. Notice this verse that we're looking at, verse number 52. A lot of it has to do with social causes. A lot of it has to do with means for us to become civil citizens of society. وَأَوْفُ الْكَيْلِ Before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you, take care of the orphans. Of course, He told you not to take their wealth and not to do anything to their wealth, but He's implying, take care of that whole genre of society, the orphans within society. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, when you're about to transact with one another, then have manners of transact. One of the main manners of transactions is, وَأَوْفُ الْكَيْلِ Fulfill the measures. When you're giving somebody something and, you're, and it's in measurement, basically al-kayl means volume. Historically and even in modern day, most things are either weighed with in a, in a measurement, in volume, or they're weighed with the weight itself, as in the kilograms or the liters, right? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whether it happens to be the kilos or it happens to be the liters, you make sure that you're measuring properly. You make sure that there's ifa occurring. Notice in some verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells people, do not... You know, do not bring a defect within the measurement. So don't decrease your measurement. Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you to complete and perfect the measurement. Why? Because these are those powerful commandments that command to all things that are good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't stop at just don't, you know, don't decrease the measurement. Give him as much as he deserves. Allah says, perfect it and complete it. Even if you have to go beyond to perfect it at times, then go ahead and do that because that is when you are actually living up to these commandments. وَأَوْفُ الْكَيْلَ mizan. Stick to this commandment of Allah Azza wa Jal. Perfect the measure and perfect also the weight of things. And along with this, any other concept when it comes to sales. And I remember one of my mashayikh told me that his shaykh, he used to sell trees. Okay, imagine that for a second. He used to sell trees. And when, what he would do is, as he's selling the trees, he would make sure that the person that's buying from him, he knows every single fault within the tree. Even if a branch is a little bit crooked or the leaves are coming off or something, he would walk around the entire tree looking for all the defects within the tree and he'll say, well, look over here, there's a little scratch. Of course trees have scratch, man, come on. But he'll go from, from tree to tree whilst he's selling, making sure that the person sees all the problems, even insignificant problems within the trees. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in his wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally put barakah in this man's wealth. And I, I'll tell you from personal experience as well. I've tried this when you sell your personal products, even if it's your car. Don't do that little paint job at the end and say, well, this car has no problem, never been in a car accident. If you want to tell him, tell him all of the problems within it. And that's why Allah's Prophet said, he said what? He said that if they end up telling the truth, فَإِن صَدَقَ وَبَيَّنَا بُورِكَ لَهُمَا فِي بَيْعِهِمَا If they end up telling the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put barakah in their wealth. وَإِن كَذَبَ وَكَتَمَا مُحِقَتْ بَرَكَةُ بَيْعِهِمَا And if they end up lying to one another and hiding the faults within the product at hand, or within the money for example, if it happens to be gold, it's not really full gold, or etc. Right? Allah's Prophet ﷺ said that Allah takes away the barakah from that sale. You want barakah in your transactions, then live up to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to your transactions. وَأَوْفُ الْكَيْلِ And by the way, when Allah is saying بِالْقِسْطَ at the end, remember, justice is for the buyer and the salesman alike. In Islam, we don't just look at the person that's buying stuff and we say, well, this guy deserves his right because he's a client. We also have rights for the person that's a salesman and the merchant. Miskeen merchant. In certain parts of the world, there's always the client, 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 the merchant, we forget there, that he also has rights as well, to a degree. Look at this. La darara wa la dirar. There is no harm, and there is no mutual harm, to a degree, that if a buyer, a buyer, he comes and purchases something, and accidentally the salesman sells it for a lower price than it was actually marketed for, maybe for, because, for example, it had the wrong price tag, or for example, it was sitting in the wrong shelf, etc., the buyer in an ideal situation within Islamic law has the right to find that sell- the seller has within the ideal situation in Islamic law has the right to go to the buyer and say, well, you know what, I accidentally sold it to you for that price. Would you be able to give it back to me? Ideally, the person should give it back to him. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَقَالَ نَادِي مَنْ بَيْعَتَهُ أَقَالَ اللَّهُ عَثْرَتَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever ends up allowing the person that had you know that has remorse about a transaction that he's gotten himself into then uh, he allows him to discontinue in the transaction allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away his sins on the day of judgment i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take mine 
and yours and all of our sins away on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا نكلف نفسا إلا وسعها. We do not burden a soul except that which it can bear. So this particular interjection within the passage, notice all of those passages that you're looking at throughout, they are a command to the Prophet ﷺ to deliver a message on. So it's almost as if the Prophet ﷺ is speaking. But every now and then, to hit a point right home run, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the tense to him speaking. So now Allah says, لا نكلف نفسا إلا وسعها. Yes, I've given you seven commandments before. They seem very difficult, but believe you me, I haven't burdened the soul, that which it cannot bear. So the action item today is when you start selling, make sure you're telling all of the faults of the product at hand. And don't do the last minute paint job just so you can sell your car and so on and so forth. If you end up doing it, then tell the person that this was a car that was in a car accident. This was a product that has a bit of a defect. I fixed it up. I patched it up. You'd like to purchase it. Go ahead. So the person doesn't end up cursing you when he buys and he finds, well, this car just fell apart. Or this engine, it was working now, but now it's not working anymore. Right? You don't want to have the people's curses on you. You want to live in peace. And just because of a few dollars, you don't want that you know, burden on yourself. Jazakumullahu khairan for listening. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. The Ten Commandments. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين The Ten Commandments, this is your brother Abdul Wahab Salim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَإِذَا قُلْتُمْ فَعْدِلُوا Whenever you speak, then be just in your speech Every single person amongst us or most people amongst us, we speak, right? We all know how to speak some speak a little bit, some people are chatterboxes, they keep speaking, right? And some people are able to speak a lot, but they don't speak much. They choose not to speak. And this is a quality within human beings that they are able to speak and converse. Sometimes we are able to say good things and bad things, and we have a choice to do that. We can say good things, we can say bad things, we can say nothing. That's all choices that we make. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you make a choice of actually speaking, it's an educated decision. At that moment, when you're about to make that decision, then start remembering justice. Start remembering justice. Otherwise, don't speak. If you either, when you're speaking and you choose to speak, then speak with justice. If you choose not to speak, then that is your choice. But if you do make that educated decision of speaking, then make sure your speech is nothing but good. It's gauged with the index of what? Of justice. And that's why a poet says, قَدْ يُحْرِزُ الْوَرِعُ التَّقِيُّ لِسَانَهُ خَوْفَ الْكَلَامِ وَإِنَّهُ لَمُفَوَّهُ Some people are able to speak, mashaAllah. You meet them, they're very silent. But as soon as they get the opportunity to say something important, Bam, they bring you the most important fact. You never thought that this person could produce such information and be able to say it so eloquently. But the point is, the person is able to speak, but he chooses not to. And that's from hikmah. And this poet is saying that maybe a pious person may end up withholding from speaking. Why? Because he's afraid of the results that will occur because of speech. There are outcomes of speech. There are, keep that in mind, whenever we speak, we have to remember that there are outcomes of speech. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said that maybe a person will end up following, falling 70 years into the hellfire because of one, one kalima, one statement that the person says. One statement, really? Are you kidding me? Yes, I'm not kidding you. This is the messenger talking. One statement, one word. Sometimes the utterance of one word can lead a person so far in the deep depths of hellfire that the person will never be able to come out again. That's the kalimat al-kufr. That's the statement of disbelief. If a person educatedly makes a statement of disbelief, then that's his choice. But he has to be able to bear the burden and the consequences of that cho choice that he makes. Sometimes we say things to people that are also you know, consequential. There are consequences for everything you say. And that's why a pious person, a smart person, a person with hikmah, stay silent. I want to give you two examples over here of how people lose justice and how people end up losing focus on this idea of justice when speech occurs. Number one, when people start to hate 
or love people too much. If you love someone too much, then you lose focus on justice. If you hate someone too much, then you also lose focus on justice. Those are the two points in which your compass is not directed in the right direction anymore. Why? Because you either love him too much, so you're going to be doing ghulu in his regards, you'll be very, very excessive in his regards, or you hate him too much, and then also that same thing occurs. And that's why in our expression, in our feelings towards people, we have to be balanced. So either love or hate, when it gets out of its boundaries, when it becomes, you know, when it goes into the state of tughyan, transgression, above where it's supposed to be, above where it, it, it is supposed to remain, then we start to either say good things, two good things, things that are not even within the person about that individual, and then problems occur, or we start to say bad things, things that are not within the person, because of the fact that we hate the person so much. And no, we as people are commanded to stand with justice. So don't love people excessively, don't hate people excessively. Maybe the person you love so excessively today and you so, say all these beautiful things about, tomorrow he'll be your worst enemy. And then what happens, all of those statements come back to you. People say, well, yesterday you used to say all these things about him, right? Maybe that person that you hate so much, tomorrow he'll become your friend and then you'll never be able to show him your face properly. Why? Because you said A, B, C about him, right? So love people, but love them with balance. Number two, I want to share a story with you. A story of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this story of Umar ibn Khattab, it's, it's a very, very brilliant story, very, very relevant story to what we're living through today. And that is the story in which a man came to Umar ibn Khattab. He said, I have a daughter. She was in Jahiliyyah, in ignorant times. And during these ignorant times, she ended up having a child outside of marriage. And then she tried to kill herself because she was regretful and remorseful about what happened. And then what happened? I ended up saving her life. She took a knife, tried to slit herself to death. I ended up saving her life by the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now she's of age for marriage and men are coming to me. And they are saying we would like to get married to her. Should I tell them those things that she'd done in the past? Umar ibn al-Khattab became enraged. He said, how do you ata'amidu ila sitrin? How do you end up going to a cover, a veil that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon a person and then go and uncover it? Even though Allah is the one that's placed it, He wants these things to be covered and you go and try to reveal it to people, don't do it. He goes so far and he says Umar ibn Khattab out of his anger, and we all know Umar ibn Khattab every time his sword is right there. So he says that if you end up doing it, then I'll make you nakalan li ahl al amsar. I'll I'll make you an example for all of the people that are in all countries across the world. As in, do not uncover and unveil the sins of the people in the past. And this is from justice. When you end up, you know, losing that direction of justice, then you end up saying things about people of their past. Someone's left their past. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one that will either reward him or he's the one that will take. Take him to account for his past. He has sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fixed his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then who are we to come in the middle of him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, well, you did and you used to and this and that? No. People make tawbah, we don't unveil them. And another phenomenon in our times is that people unveil themselves. They'll come out on TV and say, you know, I used to be like this and I used to be like that and this and that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me, right? These are not things that are to be said. If you have committed a sin, then you hide those sins, you protect those sins, you, you know, protect them from being revealed to other people because these are not some things that a person should be happy about. And sometimes people are actually bo bo boastful. Brother, you don't know what I used to do in my past, man. No, don't do that, Habibi. If you did something in your past, keep it to yourself. If you can hide it, keep it to yourself. If it's been hidden, nobody knows about it, keep it to yourself. It's not something to be boastful about. Your past, if it's evil, then how do you boast in front of people about something evil that you've done? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to practice, to convey. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to say those things that are absolutely just, even if it happens to be someone we either love too much or someone we hate too much. Jazakumullah khairan for listening. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.
The Ten Commandments. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. The Ten Commandments, this is your brother Abdul Wahab Salim. Now we're looking at commandment number nine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa bi'ahdillahi awfu. And with the ahad, the covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, shall you do wafa. The covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does that mean? And what does wafa mean? Wafa means to bring something such that there is no defect within it. So you, if you're trying to bring a matter to somebody, he's assigned you an assignment, you want to make sure you perfected the assignment and then you bring it to that person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I've given you a ahad. Ahadullah, the ahad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with this ahad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should you do wafa, should you bring it and fulfill it completely? Now what exactly is this Ahad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And notice a couple of, you know, one line before or two lines before, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَوْفُ kail, Fulfill the measurement. But he talks about fulfillment there first and foremost because that's really important. But over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make reference to the fulfillment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Ahad first because that's what's more significant. When you recognize that this is a covenant, Right away from the get-go, you hear that tough word, covenant, powerful. As soon as you hear the word covenant, right away you start thinking something great. It's like there's some sort of treaty or something like that, right? The word ahad is a powerful word. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts by striking home run with this really powerful word. So you remember to listen very, very carefully from this point onward. There's a covenant we're talking about. It's not a joke. And this covenant is not my covenant or your covenant. This is a covenant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you have a treaty with a certain country that's really powerful, you start being very wary about how to interact with that because you've got this treaty, you have to uphold it. When you have a treaty with Allah, you have a covenant with Allah, you have a relationship of such sort with Allah, then you have to start being careful. What exactly is this covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could be a covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made with us. And what's that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told us in the Qur'an, saying, Alam a'ahad ilaykum. Alam a'ahad ilaykum. Did I not make a covenant to you? Allah ta'budu shaytan. Did I not make a covenant? with you, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, Allah ta'budu shaytan, that you shouldn't be worshipping shaytan. So there's a covenant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards us, He made this oath with us, that we will never ever be worshipping shaytan. Right? So this is one type of covenant with Allah. But then there's also a covenant that we make towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we've made this covenant, every single one of us, whether we remember it or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this covenant in the Qur'an, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended up taking مِن بَنِي Adam From the children of Adam From the children of Adam مِن ظُهُورِهِمْ From their backs ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ Their progeny So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the progeny of every individual from his from his wuhur, from his back, from his dhahar. And after he took everybody out, everybody was before him, and he said to everybody, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? Every single person testified. And he, they all said, Qalu bala, shahidina. Everyone said, of course, of a surety, you, O oh, our Lord, are, is definitely our only Lord. So we all accepted the divinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is our covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we'll f abide by the fact that He is the only divine Lord. He is the only Lord worthy of our devotion, our worship, our submissiveness, our servitude, that all of that, inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati, indeed my salah, indeed my prayer, indeed my sacrifice, indeed my life, indeed my death, all of that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a covenant we've already taken. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ That you may end up saying on the Day of Judgment, إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِرِينَ Don't end up coming on the Day of Judgment and telling me that you forgot this. You've already done it, it's occurred, it's been written. 
Allah has given us a covenant not to worship shaitan. We've given the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covenant that He's our divine Lord alone. We have to abide by this. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word Ahdullah, the covenant of Allah to generalize both covenants from both angles. The covenant we gave to Allah, our transaction with Him, the covenant He took from us or He gave to us to not worship shaitan, all of that is there. It's all there. And then on top of that we have another covenant. We have a covenant in which Allah didn't initiate it, we did not initiate it. Now this is a covenant that we initiate with mankind, everybody on earth. So we have a covenant with people. Somebody makes a transaction with someone, he says, I promise you I'll do such and such. But the person doesn't end up following through. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O who you believe, awfu bil uqood. When you have a transaction, then fulfill the transaction properly. So why would this be called the Ahd of Allah, the covenant of Allah? Because Allah is the one that's obliged you to make sure that you fulfill that covenant with other people as well. So you have one covenant from you to Allah, one from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you, all of that you have to fulfill. And then you have another covenant that you give to people, that also needs to be fulfilled. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, with the Ahd of Allah do wafa, all of that is included within those three words. And that's why I said this is an extremely powerful Powerful set of three words. You can memorize them right now. Wabi ahdillahi awfu. That's it. So the take home message and the action item today is that from now on, you have three promises. You have a promise that you have given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is your only Lord. You have a ahad from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards you and you have to live by it. And that is the fact that from this point onwards, we're not going to worship shaitan in the least and we're not going to worship our own desires. Rather, our devotion and servitude and our submissiveness will be with Allah subhanahu wa towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for Him alone. That is our ahad, that is our covenant. And last but not least, whenever we transact with people, we have to make sure we're transacting properly such that we don't lie, such that we live up to our promises. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيدة وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم This is the Ten Commandments series and this is the final and last commandment the Tenth Commandment and the Tenth Commandment by the way is a commandment that simply sums up all of the other commandments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shared with us in these verses in Surah Al-An'am. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا And this right here is my path. Allah described to you a very very long list of things, right? Nine things. Allah says, all of this is my path. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا This is my path that is a very straight path. It has... A very, very straight course. You can get on this path and it's, it ends up in Jannah. That's where it goes. Mustaqim and extremely straight. There are no turns and twists and there is no ups and downs. It's very, very straight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left us on a straight path. فَاتَّبِعُوهُ Then follow the straight path. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ And don't follow all the other paths that are there as well. And the Prophet wasallam had drawn a line for a straight path and across it he'd drawn other lines as well. And the Prophet ﷺ was trying to say that this is the straight path and then along the way there's going to be all these other turns. Don't take those turns. Khattan Nabi wasallam a khattan, the Prophet ﷺ drew a path and then along with those paths, on the other ends of the path, Allah's Messenger وسلم, drew lines and those lines are not the correct path. He was trying to say this right here is the Surat al-Mustaqim, the path that is extremely straight, the path that has no crookedness within it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the same thing. But notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as-sirat as the sirat. Okay? But when he talks about the other paths, he calls them what? A sabil. A sabil can be a thick and narrow path. A very, very tight, sorry, narrow path, right? And it can be a very big path as well. 
But a sirat is a big path. A sirat is a more specific path. Sabil is a general term for any path, but sirat has some qualities. We're going to discuss the qualities of a sirat in a moment. Okay? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, follow this path, wala tattabi'u subul, and don't follow the other paths, the sabils. And then he says, فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ Then if you end up following those other sabils, it will take you away from my sabil. So we know that there is a sabil that is a general term. It's used for a good and bad path. It's used for a path of the path of Allah, and it's used for paths that are other than the paths of Allah. But the path of Allah has a specific name, and that is al-sirat, and more specifically al-mustaqim. Okay, all of that is clear so far. Sabil is the path of Allah, and the path of other than Allah subhanahu wa taala. Al-sirat is that specific path that is for Allah subhanahu wa taala, and that's why He says, "Fatafarraq bikum an sabilihi." If you end up following those other paths, what it will do? It will take you away from the main path. All right, there's a reason why I keep going to this. Why? Because I want to stop and talk about al-sirat for a second. Al-sirat is the word that Allah uses for His own path, al-mustaqim even more so, the one that is straight. Al-sirat, it comes from the word sarata, or istarata, originally with a seen instead of a sad. And then later on, the seen was transformed into a sad because the ta, they're thick letters, and it was because of the ease of pronunciation, it became al-sirat. Instead of a sirat, and the word sarata it means to swallow something. Istarata shayb tala'ahu. If somebody swallows something, you say istaratahu. Okay. And the reason why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uses this word that has this connotation of swallowing something is because when you're on the path of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, then you will feel swallowed and indulged. You're totally indulged and engrossed within whatever you're upon. And that's why whenever you feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are indulged in the deen. If you're not feeling indulged, then you have to check something. You may be doing something wrong within your lives. There may be something you're doing. You may be generally on the right path, but you may be taking a little bit of detour every now and then. So when you fix those detours, you'll feel indulged because the path is such that it almost envelops you, swallows you. Imagine a person walking down a long road. When you see him walking, when he gets towards the end of your viewing range, the person will almost be swallowed right into the path. He'll still be on there, but it's as if he's swallowed into the path. This path is such that when you are on it, fully on it, when you go further and further on it, you will remain even more further and further firm on it because it indulges you, it involves you, and it almost swallows you right into it. This is what you're on now. You become firmer and firmer. If you're not becoming firmer and firmer in your religion, then you're doing something wrong. And you have to start questioning yourself about that. What is it that I'm doing wrong? Is it that my connection to Allah is not strong? Is it that my connection to the Qur'an is not strong? Is it that I'm not giving the rights of my neighbors, my family members? What is it that I'm doing wrong? Is it that I'm not giving my zakat? Sometimes it could be something like that. You're not doing your obligations. Whatever it may be, there may be something you have to ask Allah. And by the way, if there's something within your religion that you're doing, especially when it deals with other people and harm towards other people, you'll never feel the halawa, the sweetness of iman. And there will be no reason, apparently, for you to not be able to feel that sweetness. But you turn to Allah in devotion and make dua to Allah. Oh Allah, allow me to recognize the fault because of which I'm not able to connect to you. Allow me to recognize the fault because of which I'm not able to have the same sweetness in my salah. Oh Allah, allow me to recognize the fault because of which I'm not able to ponder and recognize the beauties of the Qur'an. And Allah will show you and guide you to those. Another point about the sirat is the fact that it is a very vast path. And this is very very important to note. Sirat is a very vast path. And I'll tell you something, that one of my mashayikh, he once said that, and he's a very, very famous sheikh, I will choose not to mention his name because he mentioned this in a, in a private gathering. He said that the path from here, from Ar-Riyad to Mecca, is a path that is a highway. It's got a lot of lanes. And we have people out there that have a tendency of just throwing 
you know, bombarding people with accusation in their faith, in their aqidah, in their manhaj, and all sorts of things. He said there are people that are going on one lane, and there's another group of people that are going on another lane, another group of people going on a third lane. All of those lanes are ending towards where? Towards Mecca. They'll all get there no matter which car you're driving, no matter which lane you're on, so long as you're on the path to Jannah. So a sirat is not a very, very thin path. You could say a darb would be a thin path. You could say a sabil might be a thin path. You could say a tariq might be a thin path. A sirat, one of the qualities of this sirat is that it's very vast, it's accommodating. And that's Islam, Islam is accommodating. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Prophet, Apostle, He teaches us to be with as sawadul a'zam, the people who are the vast majority of the ummah, all of them can fit on this path. The vast majority of this ummah can fit on this sirat. And that's why Allah chooses the term of sirat, because all of them, insha'Allah ta'ala, are going in a good direction. The vast majority of the ummah that is. And this is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prefers the term of sirat over other things. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا This is my path, it is a straight path. فَاتَّبِعُوا Then follow this straight path. سَلَكُوا بُنَيَّاتِ الطَّرِيقِ فَأَصْبَحُوا مُتَنَكِّبِينَ عَنِ الطَّرِيقِ الْأَكْبَرِ As Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Sayyiduna Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says that, سَلَكُوا بُنَيَّاتِ الطَّرِيقِ فَأَصْبَحُوا مُتَنَكِّبِينَ عَنَ الطَّرِيقِ الْأَكْبَرِ That the, they, the people, they ended up going into the different paths. Okay, you have a road, a major road, a major highway, and then you have another, other roads that also lead to that same path, and sometimes they may come to a dead end. Okay, those are called subul, or those are called بُنَيَّاتُ الطَّرِيقِ Little daughters of the path. As in little extensions of the path. So sometimes you can take a little left turn. If you see the highway is you know, really, really tough at the moment, you take your little left turn and leave and take the side road, the village road. People get stuck on those village roads. You have a major goal here to accomplish. And you have major points within Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, don't go on those side roads. Stay on the highway. The highway is this sirat that I'm discussing. What's that sirat? Those are the nine points that we've already discussed. And the tenth point that we're discussing today. The nine commandments that we've already discussed. And the tenth commandment that we're discussing today. And that is to remain firm on all of these things and everything else that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and he says ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ this is the wasiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you may have fear I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a tawfiq to have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one last point I'm going to make one last point and that is notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off these verses in verse number 151, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes it off and says, ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ In verse number 152, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَذَكَّرُونَ And in verse number 153, He says, ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ He's trying to remind you of the three phases that you're going to need to go through in order for you to accomplish perfection within these ten things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So you may have intellect. So in order for you to understand the benefit within these, you have to have a brain, you have to have intellect. And then if you have a brain, but you don't use that brain. Some people have a brain, but they fry it by drinking. They fry it by smoking. They fry it by smoking marijuana and drugs. Those, are, those people are not using their brains. By the end of it, they don't have brain cells and they lost the intellect as well. Other people use this brain in tadakkur and pondering and contemplating. He says if you use the brain, in contemplating these things, then you would have achieved to the point of tadakkur when you end up doing the tadakkur with your aql, when you have a brain, you use the brain, then you'll get to the point of taqwa that you'll actually implement these because you'll recognize the powerful nature of these commandments and you'll recognize the benefit of these commandments within your dunya and within your hereafter. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us recognize the benefit within these commandments. My appeal to you at the end of this series is that you look at these commandments and make them, maybe make a chart. This is the action item. Take a, take a chart and go and make, write down this chart and put it on your wall. So every day when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you see after you do your dhikr when you wake up is these 10 things. These are the 10 things, the 10 commandments that I got to live by. This is the sirat Allah al-mustaqeem. This is the sirat of Allah that is straight. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq again to practice, to convey. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.